welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to be here because I left Red Hat six months ago. So I didn't expect me to see that many Red Hatters that soon, uh, but it's always a great experience. My name is Vasek Pavlin. I now work for a company called Blockchick, um, and I'm leaving that company. Uh, never mind. Uh, so I want to talk about Web3, blockchain, uh, and these things, and I want to talk about how it's open and potentially open source, and how I think, I believe, I hope, uh, it actually inherits some of the open source um, mantras and approaches and, and like uh, uh, promises, right? Um, so I got the single only one response to me speaking about this on this conference was this. Um, so I wanted to front run that by saying, please don't be mad at me, don't be angry, don't shout, don't scream, don't hit me. Uh, I understand that many people are concerned about environment, I'm too. I don't want our planet to end up like this uh, by, by burning so much electricity through mining and all these things. But I don't want to talk about that because that's a philosophical question that I don't understand. I am not an environmental expert um, and I'm not, I'm not developing proof of work blockchains or anything like that. I develop applications on top of blockchain and I try to use less resource demanding blockchains as much as possible. Uh, so I wanted to show you something nice so whenever you get mad at me please think about this little kitten uh, imagine it uh, imagine how you uh, how you wrap its fur and how it calms you down and don't don't be mad please so what is web3 as this gentleman here can show you nobody knows um, it's a it's a buzzword really uh, but we are used to buzzwords at Red Hat uh, containers were a buzzword and uh, web scale and like all these things, right? Uh, it is a, there is some technology that, that changes the world sometimes. I think this may be one of those. Uh, it may be changing not all lives, but some lives, like containers that change lives of software architects probably and how they design applications. So Web3 can change lives of some other people, which I don't know who, that, who those would be yet. Um, but generally, Web3 is like an extension of what is called Web2, uh, which is like Facebooks and Googles and YouTubes, and we want to make it, we want to make Web3 a better place where to be, where nobody tells you what you can do and you cannot do, and, and where nobody is kind of like stealing your data and whatever. Um, I can't explain that very well, at least not without pictures, so I stole this picture from Anderson Horowitz presentation about the state of Web3 and basically explains that Web1, that's like, I don't know, 1990s, I guess, 80s, is read-only basically. You could create a website and put content there, but you would have to know how to do it. You would have to have your own server, maintain that, manage that. You couldn't just come to a website and start posting blog posts and videos and things like that. So it's kind of read-only for the general public. Then we have Web2, that's where we live now, and you can post a video on YouTube, post uh, at post at, on Facebook. Um, you can write and read. You can be content producer and content consumer. In Web3, the expectation or the goal is to be a content consumer, content producer, and an owner. So if you post something to Facebook, then Facebook owns that content. If you post something to YouTube, then YouTube owns that content, and they can say, no, we don't like it, you can't post it here, take it away. Uh, well, they not take it away, they will take it away, right? Uh, or take down your channel or something. In Web3, the idea is that you own the content, or you can co-own the platform that the content is displayed on, or uh, you can co-own the protocol that, that, that uh, kind of runs that platform. Um, and that way, um, they want to basically give you the ability to own a piece of internet, um, if I use their words. So what does it mean to me um, from more like a lower, lower level perspective? I think Web3 can be built out of these three terms or technologies, uh, and it can also be built without basically any of them, which sounds potentially weird, but I think hopefully this is like the technology that we are trying to use now or, or approaches that make sense and, and the best web free version can be made out of these. So blockchain as an open, permissionless, 
interoperable database where you can store information and you can store the transactions, whatever that is. It can be uh, like an economical transaction, financial transaction, but it can be also that, um, I don't know, you followed someone or you liked someone's post. Um, then there are tokens, which is kind of the financial part of the thing. So uh, when it says own, uh, there is often financial incentive in there uh, because like all those big companies, they, they, they make money of you posting that content and Web3 promises that you make money out of posting that content. Um, so the tokens are there to like kind of keep the money flow and keep the financial system going through, the, through that whole ecosystem. And then there are devs, which is basically the web applications or the applications developed on top of these, utilizing blockchain, utilizing uh, some kind of incentive for people to use the platform, uh, hopefully being distributed as in nobody can shut them down, nobody can uh, uh, block you from accessing them. Uh, but it's ideal world, that's not how it works usually, but, but that's kind of the goal where we, want, where we want to be, ideally. And I think that this is kind of how uh, how open source works as well, right? You want something that is interoperable. You want your source, your source code with a public API, a well-documented API that anyone can take and interact with your open source project. Uh, you want that to be transparent. Everyone should understand what's going on there, why you are making decisions. So that's why you have your code on GitHub or GitLab and you basically uh, want, to, want the community to come and, and look at how things are decided so that they can contribute and they connect with the rest of the community. And you want it to be permissionless. You don't want to like, block people from contributing to your project. And that's the same for Web3. The goal is to be interoperable. That's like, obviously we are talking about public blockchains, not private blockchains. I mean, private blockchain is a uh, expensive database and that's it. There's nothing else there. Public blockchains, so if I put in a smart contract that represents some asset in a game, potentially someone can come and say, if you own an asset in this game, uh, you can also get, I don't know, uh, a t-shirt for free because I'm printing t-shirts and I wanna do some marketing. And that's, I think, part of the interoperability. The transparency, if I interact with Jakub here and I send him the money that he paid for my coffee, everyone can see that, right? Because uh, it's transparent. And that's the same for if someone does something bad, uh, so I've explained a couple examples of where bit blockchain actually makes sense during the day. So I'm going to say it here as well. Um, one example is that Polygon, which is one of the blo big blockchain networks, they worked with an Indian government where there was an issue uh, that if someone reported a crime, let's say some woman was raped or something, and they reported the crime, and it's the issue with police was not that the crime didn't get solved, but that the crime disappeared. Like the report disappeared and never happened. So they went, government went to the Polygon uh, project and said implement something that solves this. And they did a blockchain project where now if you report a crime, it goes on top of that blockchain and it's there forever. And if someone removes it, which potentially is still possible, at least there is a record that someone put it in and someone removed it. And then you have kind of the, the foe in the story uh, who is doing that. Um, so that's the transparency and then permissionless as I said, if you have an open source community, uh, you don't want, like we have these, all these uh, code of conduct and like be welcoming and then try to get diverse people. And part of that is permissionless. Like if you, if you have a group of people that you say, no, you can't contribute to my project because I don't like you, th that doesn't work, right? And that's what we want from that free and, and blockchain perspective. We want anyone to be able to interact with the applications without some authority saying, no, you can't. So, as I want to focus on the open source part here, I picked some projects that are open source and that are heavily used as part of Web3 ecosystem. Uh, so I split it into front end, back end, and the actual blockchain part, uh, just for you to have some reference of like, if I, I have no clue how to join this Web3 movement and be successful in something new and exciting and hyped up because containers, containers are boring now. Um, and you can take one of these projects and look at that, contribute to the community. So from front-end perspective, um, very well-known framework for developing front-end is React and it's heavily used to develop uh, kind of blockchain-based applications where you interact with blockchain directly from, from the front-end. Um, so there is not much to talk about there. 
Then there is Ethos.js, which is the library that wraps the calls to blockchain to smart contracts and allows you to, to call it from the front end uh, easily and simply and manage wallets and things like that. So it's very useful to, to understand. And then there is TypeChain, which is uh, based on TypeScript. So if you're not using pure JavaScript, but you're using TypeScript, uh, which allows you to do um, like typed JavaScript, um, the type chain allows you to generate uh, uh, typings for the smart contract and then call that as a method on an object. So it makes it very easy to interact with smart contracts by just basically instantiating an object and, and call that. Um, and all of these obviously are open source. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about that. Uh, from the backend perspective, because uh, often people think like, okay, so I have this blockchain thing and that's it, right? No, so you still need front end for some user experience and you often need back end for aggregation of the data because blockchain will not help you with that. So there is very interesting project, The Graph. Um, and like, even if you're not interested in blockchain, I think this is a really cool project. They do the aggregation. So every smart contract can emit events. An event can be like a, a information about what happened. So transaction from, to, how much. Um, and you can build a, a, a mapping into the, the graph, which automatically inge uh, ingests the events and then builds your GraphQL uh, API on top of that. Uh, and then you can easily query that instead of calling the blockchain directly. So you can potentially take any blockchain-based project and build the graph for it uh, on your own and then do an aggregation layer on top of that and, and make uh, something useful for the project. IPFS, Interplanetary File System, I've heard about it at Red Hat before I left Red Hat and before I actually did something with blockchain. Because it's an interesting project which tries to solve permanent storage, uh, distributed permanent storage. So basically you upload something to some IPFS nodes. Uh, those objects have unique identifier like in S3, in AWS S3 basically, it's a unique hash. And then as you access it, it gets copied over in the network. And the network, anyone can join it. It's, again, permissionless. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can basically get access. Um, as the more it's used, the more copies, the quicker access to the data. And it's a, like essentially, hmm? Pied Piper. Pied Piper. Uh, and essentially, it is basically, um, hopefully, it is permanent there and never going to get deleted. And then Go Ethereum, uh, that's basically the most popular um, client for Ethereum. And I think it's cool because it's Golang, and I really like, really like Golang, and I know a lot of people at Red Hat do too. That's why I put it in there. Uh, it's a very nice way to interact with blockchain on backend um, if you need to build something on top of your smart contracts. And then for the blockchain development, again, for the smart contracts, Hardhead is a nice tool to wrap your development with tests and deployment scripts and automation and things like that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suite of utilities and extensions to, to make it easier. Not that many people use it, so that's why there is so many hacks, because people don't test their smart contracts, and it sucks. I hate it uh, that they don't. Uh, then I have Solidity, which is a programming language for Ethereum-compatible chains, uh, how you program the smart contracts, also open source. Uh, and then MetaMask, it's an extension for managing your wallets. So you can create the wallet or import your private key there, and then you can see how much tokens and NFTs you have in there and stuff like that, and it's also open source. Uh, some interesting repositories or projects to look at if you are interested in the smart contracts or even the front-end development, where I take my inspiration from when I'm implementing something. Uniswap, uh, it's a decentralized exchange, um, and they are one of the like, uh, biggest um, innovators in the space. Aave, that's lending protocol, and Open Zeppelin, that's basically, they do like security stuff, uh, but they also provide a lot of implementation of uh, standards. So if there is an Ethereum standard for like tokens, NFTs, all these things, um, they will have a library for that that you can use and you don't have to write this, like implement the standard on your own. And uh, the reason why I have these here, it's, it's often hard to start from scratch. So if you are familiar with front end, maybe you can go and look at one of these projects and, and check their front end implementation and, and get some understanding. If you are into back end or into an actual smart contract development, uh, the Aave smart contracts are crazy and I don't understand them because I like the financial understanding of how they work and what they do there. It's very complex. Um, and basically my last slide here is that um, Web3 is trying to push a new model. I've talked about it with a couple people here al already, so if you heard the story uh, or heard the idea, I'm sorry, I'm going to bore you potentially. But there is something that was described by uh, the guy from Zora. It's one of the links there. 
and it's, he calls it hyperstructures. Uh, up until now, anything we've built as a software, we have to maintain and we have to improve upon, right? We have to maintain it, we have to make sure it's running, we have to make sure uh, there is infrastructure for it, uh, we have to pay bills to AWS or some other provider. Uh, but the idea of hyperstructure is that you build something that you deploy on blockchain, and as long as the blockchain is available, which hopefully is forever, as long as people are incentivized to run the nodes, um, it's there and it's working and it's running on its own without any fees, without any, uh, any company behind it. And I think it makes a lot of sense because I take blockchain as infrastructure. So if you're building something on top of OpenShift, then OpenShift is your blockchain. It's bad, but like on that level for me. I don't develop blockchains, I don't develop Ethereum, I develop applications on top of it. But the good thing about blockchain for me is that it's always there, it's always running, I don't have to do anything, I don't have to set up anything, I just can deploy my smart contracts and they will be running as long as I have users using them. And the idea of hyperstructures is then that you develop something that you deploy and it's there and it's running and nobody has to take care of it, nobody has to maintain it, nobody has to do monitoring of it, Obviously, uh, bugs, issues appear, so we have to think about upgradability or migrations and things like that. But like, you don't have to have an SRE sitting in front of a computer and watching logs of some container on your OpenShift if it's hyperstructure based on blockchain because the smart contracts will just be there and working. Um, so that's how they approach Zora V3, and that's a, that's an open source uh, market, uh, NFT marketplace. Uh, definitely, the, the smart contracts are pretty simple, but the, the kind of hyperstructure idea is there. Um, and then Lens protocol is quite new, probably like two weeks old. It's by the, oops, uh, by, it's by Aave, and it's a social graph. So if you imagine Twitter, Facebook, all these things where you can follow people and comment, they, they are building an open social protocol uh, where you can come, you can create profile, and you can follow people, uh, and, and all of that is recorded on chain. So they can't shut it down because the contracts will be there and they can't remove them, um, and they can't block you. It would have to be some kind of another layer on top of that that would basically give you the access to the contracts that does not show your profile. So if a company is built on top of that, then you can't, and, and they want to block you, you can't, you, can't, uh, you, you potentially can't access that. But then the protocol itself is still there and it's completely permissionless. Um, and their contracts are really interesting and I, I still need to read uh, a bunch of them. Um, so that's it. I hope that I delivered the message that there is a lot of openness and open source happening in, around blockchain and web free and that um, it's not just uh, us burning planet um, and us uh, trying to steal your money and your wallet, private keys, and things like that. Um, so always first think about the kitten when you start thinking about blockchain. Um, and uh, well, if you can, if you can't, then, then um, there's not much I can do. That's it, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, so I can either leave or you can ask questions. Thank you very much for, for listening to this. Yes, they, if they know my wallet address, they can check, and your wallet address, they can check that there was no transaction where I paid for your coffee. So, yes, you can find people that check this and then beat me up, yes. But I'll, I'll pay for your coffee. Any more questions? Okay, now I'll take even the angry questions. Uh -huh. There is always, there needs to be the cost, right? Yes. So, so in this case, the, the, the cost is the externality of increasing the, the blockchain itself. So like everyone using it from this moment it starts existing, will be paying some very fractional cost of it existing. No. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, uh, where is the cost in the hyperstructures because there always is cost and whether the, whether the cost is kind of spread across the people that are using the blockchain, right? Uh, no, not really. Um, you pay, in blockchain you pay for transactions, you pay gas fee. So every transaction has a cost to it. 
and the users that send the transaction pay that cost, regardless of what kind of transaction that is. Um, if, if it's a hyperstructure, then if nobody is using that, there is no cost for it being there. If people use that, they have to pay the, pay the gas fee, but the gas fee is not for the project, it's not for the hyperstructure. The gas fee is for, the tran tran for, for interacting with blockchain, and it's the reward to miners or validators who run the blockchain. Does that make sense? So you don't pay anything to people that build this and run this. You pay, people, you pay for the interactive infrastructure. Imagine you are calling an AWS API for something, and you are not paying for actually running a virtual machine there, but for calling that API and getting a result. So that's basically the same with blockchain. You are submitting something, you're storing some information there, you are changing the state, and that's what you are paying for regardless of what that is. So you don't pay for it to be there. You pay when you interact with it, but you don't pay to that hyperstructure, you pay to the blockchain validators for running the blockchain. Uh, yes, like, like in, in, in theory, in theory, yes, I guess it depends on the blockchain implementation. If we talk about Ethereum, for example, then yes, as the, as the state grows, so the more smart contracts is there is deployed, more users using it, the state grows and the transactions get more expensive as the validators have to pay more and they need to be more incentivized to run the validations. So potentially, yes, but it's not, I, I don't think that it's like a, a straight line there, like with current model where you pay for a service. You, you, pay, you pay for something. Uh, so yes, if everyone, decide, if every, every person on the planet decides to deploy some smart contracts on the blockchain, the state grows uh, and, and the cost will be higher, um, depending on the blockchain, because there are blockchains which basically shard things and, and like take the unused part, they just like throw it away, and if someone wants it, they pull it from like a backend database, if I, if I may say that. Uh, and that kind of, kind of like work around this issue a bit, but it depends on like, um, there are different implementations, so it really depends on the, on the implementation. But the kind of the premise of this is that you are not specifically paying for that one thing. It just generally like grows, and as it grows, yes, there is pro potentially higher cost. But that also depends on other factors like the configuration of the blockchain, block time, and, and, and like throughput and things like that. So it can be tweaked if like the state grows too much, then there are tweaks that you can do to, to like lower the cost and that way basically eliminating this, like everyone pays for your smart contract being deployed, although not used. Yeah. Remove some unused crimes. Things like that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or solved crimes. Um, yeah. I think we're out of time anyway. So thank you again. <laughs>